صلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسول الله وعلى اله واصحابه ومن والاه وبعد today saturday the 21st of the hajj 1434 corresponding to the 26th of october 2013 we begin with the 23rd lesson of the book tahqiq wal iwah by shaykh al allama abdul aziz ibn abdullah ibn baz rahimahullah ta'ala <coughs> Visiting the Prophet's grave is neither obligatory nor a condition for Hajj, as it is er erroneously held by some people. Rather, for those who visit the Prophet's grave, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or are, or are in his vicinity, it is desirable for them to visit both his masjid and his grave. It is not, however, lawful for those living far away from Al Medina to take a journey to Al Medina with the intention to visit the Prophet's grave, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are, however, free to do so for visiting the Prophet's Masjid. When they arrive in Al Medina, they should visit the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and of his companions. In the hadith collections of Bukhari and Muslim, it is recorded that the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد المسجد الحرام ومسجد هذا والمسجد الأقصى. One should not take a journey except to three masjids. The sacred masjid, my masjid, and Al-Aqsa, and Masjid Al-Aqsa. Had it been lawful to take... In alhamdulillah, na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati amalina min yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa min yudlil falahadiyalah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allahu wahdahu la sharika lah وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد today إن شاء الله تعالى is the last lesson from the book of الإمام عبد العزيز بن باز رحمه الله تعالى a clarification and explanation of many of the matters related to Hajj and Umrah and Ziyara that is visiting Al Medina and Nabawiyyah. The author Rahimahullah Allah Ta'ala uh, points out the false belief that some people have and that is that visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is obligatory or that it is a condition for one's Hajj to be accepted and there are certain narrations that are all fabricated they are not correct they are fabricated narrations that indicate this and some people are confused by this matter and they believe that it is obligatory to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or they believe for example that it is a part of the Hajj itself that it is uh, an, an essential part of the Hajj or that is part of the Hajj at all so the author rahimahullah ta'ala is going on to clarify this misconception that some people have now as for visiting the grave of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then we've clarified in the past that this is something that is mustahab that the scholars don't differ over that issue of visiting the grave but the issue is when one comes to the city of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what should their intention be? Should their intention be to visit the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or should their intention be to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So the author here clarifies that the intention of visiting Medina that one should have in their hearts when visiting, when setting out to visit Medina, is that they are visiting the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Once they get to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they get to Medina and that was their intention for coming, then the other things come secondary. They are subsidiary to visiting the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, visiting Masjid Quba or visiting the graves of the martyrs at Uhud and visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
The author says that the proof of this, that the proof of this is the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tushaddu rihalu illa ila thalatati masajid. That one should not go out on a journey. And this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here is prohibiting one from going out on a journey except to three masjids. Al-Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. Then he says, wa masjid yada, yani this masjid of mine, and al-masjid al-Aqsa. And this hadith is collected by al-Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith, many people have a misinterpretation or don't understand what exactly does this hadith mean. What does it mean when the Prophet ﷺ said, la tushaddu rihal Just so that we understand the, the Arabic part here. Shaddu rahal what that means is when one puts a saddle on a camel. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, don't put a saddle on a camel unless you are traveling to one of these three places. And that's a euphemism for, for travel. And you do not travel except to one of these three places. Tayyip, what if someone, and we know this from the, the biographies of the Salaf, what if someone wanted to travel for seeking knowledge? Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. What if someone wanted to travel to visit a sick relative? That's okay. What if they wanted to travel for business? That's perfectly fine in Islam. So what does this hadith mean when the Prophet ﷺ said, do not travel except to three masjids? Obviously, and there is no difference of opinion on this, there is something omitted from the speech. There's something omitted from the speech, like when you say la ilaha illallah. Usually that clause when we have uh, a, a, a conditional phrase, afwan, when we have something that is accepted from, or, or a, a, there's a phrase where something later is being excluded from the original. So like when you say la ilaha illallah, you are excluding Allah from all of those false deities that are worshipped. Likewise here, something is being excluded. These three masters are being excluded. From what are they being excluded? From the prohibition of travel. Tayyip. Is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying in this hadith, do not travel to any masjid except for these three masjids? Is that the intention of the hadith? So for example, if we were to look at it like that, do not travel to visit any masjid except for these three masjids. That is Masjid al-Haram and the Prophet's Masjid and Masjid al-Aqsa. That is one interpretation. The stronger interpretation is, do not travel to any place with the intention of specifically worshiping Allah in that place, except for three masjids. Al-Masjid al-Haram, and this masjid of mine, that is the Prophet's masjid, and Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Tayyip, where do we get this interpretation from? Because other people will say, that you are making this interpretation up. Or you got this from an 8th century scholar and no one else preceded him in that understanding. And that the only prohibition is visiting other masjids. As for going traveling to visit the grave of the saints and the righteous people, and this is something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't prohibit in this hadith. So where are you getting this interpretation from? Okay. If we look at the first interpretation of this hadith, which is that it is prohibited to visit three masjids, uh, visit any masjid, except for the three, then we would say, more so, if the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from visiting masjid, then more so graves for traveling for that purpose. Traveling for the purpose of visiting masjids. So they would say, and they would admit, based on that interpretation, that going to, that traveling from one's home, for example, a person lives in the west somewhere, and they leave their home with the intention of visiting Masjid Kuba, then they would say that this hadith prohibits that. But if you want to travel to visit the grave of Hamza, then there's no problem with that. That's, that's what their interpretation would be. Tayyip. The correct interpretation is that we don't travel to any specific place or to any place with the specific intention of worshiping Allah in that place. Where do we get this interpretation from? This hadith, this hadith, 
was narrated by different companions. One of them was Abu Hurairah anhu. And he narrated as it comes in the muwatta of Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah and the Musnad of Imam Ahmed and others as well. They collected this hadith. They said that Abu Hurairah was on the way back from Turi Sayna, yani the Mount Sinai. You know Mount Sinai? What's the significance of Mount Sinai? In the Quran, it's mentioned. Because that is where Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to Musa. So Abu Hurairah says that he was on the way back from Mount Sinai. And he ran into the companion Abu Basr, uh, Abu Basra al Ghifari. And Abu Basra asked him, Where are you coming from? He said, I'm coming from Mount Sinai. I just prayed to, you know, I went there to pray. I went there to pray. Abu Basra, radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, if I would have met you before you left, you wouldn't have left. And if I had met you before you went to Mount Sinai, you would have never gone to Mount Sinai. And Abu Huraira asked him, Lima, and why is that? And then Abu Basra radiallahu ta'ala and who said, Qad sami'tu Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and yakul, la tushaddu rihal illa ila thalatati masajid. I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say, do not travel except to three masjids. Do not travel except to three masjids. And then Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who went on to talk about some more of his story because he met Ka'b al-Ahbar at the uh, Turi Sayna and some other things that he talked about. The point here is look at how Abu Basra was absolutely positively certain about the meaning of this hadith. And that is that you cannot travel, that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited one from traveling to any place for the purpose of worshiping Allah except for these three places. And look at how Abu Huraira did not give any opposition. Had he understood that this hadith didn't mean that, and that it only means to masjids or whatever else someone may come and try to interpret this hadith as meaning, then Abu Huraira had every opportunity to express that he disagreed with Abu Basra, but he didn't. And in another story of a tabi'i named Qaza'a, rahimahullah, he said that he also wanted to travel to Turi Sayna, to Mount Sinai, to pray there. And he told Ibn Umar about his intentions. And Ibn Umar told him, don't go because I heard the Prophet say, do not travel except to three masjids. Therefore, Ikhwan, when a person is traveling to Al Medina, whether he is coming from Mecca, whether he is coming from his home, and he's coming to Medina first before going to Hajj, his intention is to visit the masjid of the Prophet wasallam. And why would one give that up? The Prophet wasallam clearly in this hadith, if this hadith isn't an indication of anything, it's an indication of the virtue of the three masjids that the Prophet wasallam mentioned in the hadith. And that it is noble and something good for one to travel to visit these places. So the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he is instructing and advising those who read his book to travel to the city of the Prophet وسلم, with the intention of visiting the Prophet وسلم's masjid, then he is only instructing us to follow the hadith of the Prophet So travel with the intention of visiting the masjid, and then once you get to the masjid, visit the grave of the Prophet وسلم, and go to the Baqir, and go to the graves that are at, uh, at Uhud and you will get the reward for all of that without falling into anything that is questionable and here we don't have something that is questionable we have clear go, uh, clear opposition to the understanding of the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum of this hadith so we have at least three companions that is Abu Basra and Abu Huraira and Ibn Umar radiallahu anhum ajma'in that understood that this hadith is a prohibition to go anywhere to visit any place with the intention of specifically worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that place as for someone who travels travels for seeking knowledge there is a a sheikh 
a scholar living in a particular place and they want to go benefit from that person or there is a symposium or a conference in a certain place and they want to go to that place for that reason then this hadith is not inclusive of that because the person is not going there with the specific intention of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a particular place Likewise, a person who's going to visit a sick relative or something along these lines. So they don't fall into the opposition or opposition to this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Had it been lawful to take a journey to visit the Prophet's or someone's grave, the Prophet Sallallahu would have certainly instructed his Ummah to do so. For he was most sincere towards them, feared Allah most and knew him the best. He fully conveyed the message, directed the Ummah to every goodness and warned them against every sin. He forbade taking a journey for a purpose other than visiting the three above mentioned masajid. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تتخذوا قبري عيدا ولا بيوتكم قبورا وصلوا علي فإن تسليمكم يبلغني حيث كنتم Do not take my grave as an Eid and do not make your homes into graves and send the salat upon me because indeed your salams are conveyed to me wherever you may be. To claim traveling, <coughs> to claim that traveling to the Prophet's grave وسلم, is legislated amounts to making it an Eid. No, amounts to making it an Eid and indulging an excessive veneration which he feared. This has now become a reality and that many people indulge in it and that belief that traveling to visit his grave is part of the Sharia. Here the author Rahimullah Ta'ala goes on to say something that is extremely important for our understanding of the religion of Islam. Not just understanding this particular issue but how we understand Islam as a whole. He says here that had it been permissible, had it been something that was legislated, that is to go around visiting the graves that is to travel travel with that intention of visiting the graves then surely the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have indicated that to this Ummah and that is for anything when we look and we say well why wasn't this done during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his companions those who came after them we look and we see did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instruct his Ummah with that or not because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the author Rahimullah Ta'ala says he was ansahu nasi wa a'lamuhum billah wa akshahum lah yani he was the one who was most sincere towards Allah Azza wa Jal and most sincere towards this Ummah by way of advising the Ummah and he was the one who had the most knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and he was the one who feared Allah Azza wa Jal the most wa qad ballagha al-balagh al-mubeen Yani he conveyed this message in its totality. Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhar rasul, Ballig ma unzida ilayka min rabbik, wa illam taf'al, fa ma ballagta risalata. He said, O oh Messenger, proclaim this message. Ballig ma unzida ilayka min rabbik. Convey this message that has been revealed to you. And if you do not do so, then you have not fulfilled your job. You haven't conveyed the message. Yani, for a person now that comes and says that it is permissible to travel, to visit the grave of the Prophet wasallam, then we ask them, did the Prophet wasallam know he was going to die? What's the answer? Yes. Because every soul is going to taste death. And if, he, if that wasn't sufficient, then Allah just specifically told him in the Quran, in the kamayyit, or in the you will die and they will die as well. The Prophet knew he was going to die, and he informed this ummah that the prophets are buried where they die. They are buried where they die. And he was facing his death in the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu knew that he was going to die. So we all agree that he knew he was going to die. Do we also agree that there is no one that was more sincere in their advice to the ummah than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We agree on that point, that he was the most sincere. 
Why don't we have any hadith that is authentic where the Prophet وسلم, instructs this ummah to travel to visit him? Why don't we have any hadith that indicates that? If in fact the Prophet وسلم, knew he was going to die and be buried, and he was the most knowledgeable of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he was the most sincere of this ummah, and as the Prophet وسلم, said, that there was not a prophet who came before him. لم يكن قبل من نبي إلا كان حقا عليه أن يدل أمته على خير ما يعلمه لهم وينذرهم شر ما يعلمه لهم. There was not a prophet who came before me. This is what the Prophet says. Sahih Muslim. Except that it was wajib upon him. It was obligatory upon him. حقا عليه that he informed his ummah of the best that he knew for them and that he warned them against the most evil that he knew for them. So this is it's the job of the prophets. They instruct their ummah to do that which is good and they warn them from that which is evil. The Prophet وسلم, didn't instruct us to travel to visit his grave. That doesn't exist. But he warned us from taking his grave as an Eid, as a place of recurring visitation. He warned us from that, and he didn't instruct us to travel to visit him. So if that is not clear enough, that one should not travel with that intention of visiting the grave of the Prophet wasallam, then there is nothing else that can make it clear. And we find that there are early scholars of Islam because there are some people that are going to come to you if you say this to them and they're going to say, oh, you're just blind following Ibn Taymiyyah, one of his students. The fact of the matter is Imam Malik himself, as we mentioned yesterday, his statement about those who frequently visit the grave of the Prophet and that being something disliked. Al-Qadiyyat also talked about the prohibition of traveling to visit the graves of the pious and the saints. Ibn Battah, who died before the year 400, in the year 387, after the Hijrah, also mentioned that it is from the Bid'ah wal Muhtathat. Yani it is something that has been invented and it is a heretical practice in the religion to travel to visit the graves of the righteous and the pious. Yani he died 300 years before Ibn Taymiyyah was born. Likewise, Al-Juwaini, Abu Muhammad Al-Juwaini, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, as Al-Nawawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentions in his explanation of Sahih Muslim that Abu Muhammad Al-Juwaini who died in the year 438 also said that it was haram. He didn't say it was bid'ah. He said that it was haram to go out and visit or to travel with the intention of visiting the graves of the pious. And right there are many other scholars before Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. So we should not be confused by those people who come and they actually, and subhanAllah, one of them actually totally, totally twisted that hadith of Abu Huraira that I mentioned in the beginning of the dust. And he said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what his intention was, but he said that the proof that you can travel to visit other than these three masjids is the hadith of Abu Huraira who said that he went to Tori Sayna Yani Mount Sinai to pray there. And that's the deliver. So we just chop off the remaining hadith, the remainder of the hadith, and we change the meaning 180 degrees to make it mean opposite than what the hadith actually means. Because some people have no shame when it comes to calling to whatever they believe in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, perhaps they got blind. And he only could see the first part of that hadith, and he wasn't able to see the rest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best with his excuses, except that it appears that the likes of these type of people are only attempting to confuse the Muslims, to make them believe what they want them to believe, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So as the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentions here, that 
to say that it is legislated to travel to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will lead to one taking the grave of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam as an Eid and as a place of constant uh, visitation. We talked about the rest of that hadith yesterday. Do not make your homes into graves. In other words, don't leave off doing the nawafil salah, I need those voluntary prayers in your home. Don't leave off the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your homes because doing so would make them be like graves. The author, rahimahullah ta'ala, goes on to say after that, and here, I'll mention this in brief so that we don't have to go through the translation word by word. He goes on to say that there are certain ahadith that are mentioned on this topic. That is the topic of visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu And some of you may read them in books and some of you may hear them. They're not uncommon. They're not uncommon. Some people say them. He says, however, all of them are inauthentic when it comes to their chains. There is no, none of these ahadith have authentic chains of narrations. In fact, in fact, they are fabricated. They are concocted ahadith. Not anything that the Prophet ﷺ said, but something that someone later on came and attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. He says, so I'm going to mention to you, dear reader, I'm going to mention to you the four most common of these hadith, the four most mentioned, so that you can be aware of them. So that when you hear them, you know that they are not authentic. You know that they are fabricated and that they are not authentic. The first of those hadith is من حج ولم يزرني فقد جفاني Whoever goes out to make hajj and he does not visit me, then he has been rude to me and disrespected me. This is attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. That he said, whoever goes to make hajj and he doesn't visit me, then he has disrespected me and he has been rude to me. This hadith, as Ad-Dara Qutni and Al-Bayhaqi uh, classified it, is a weak hadith. And Ibn Abdul Hadi in as Sadam Al-Munki said that the hadith is fabricated. That it is a lie. Someone lied and attributed this to the Prophet So if you hear this, then know right away to disregard this hadith that it is not authentically reported on the Prophet The second one. Whoever visits me after my death is like the one who has visited me during my lifetime. Yani just, if you want to be a Sahabi, uh, if you want to be from the Sahaba, just go to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and give him salams. And then you can be like Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali and Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Subhanallah. Taib, this hadith uh, was classified as weak by Al-Uqayli and Ibn Hajar. And likewise, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala and Ibn Abdul Hadi both said that it was fabricated, that this hadith is fabricated. Taib, the third one. Manzarani, and this one is even stranger. Manzarani wazara abi Ibrahim fi amin wahid damantu lahu ala Allah al jannah. Whoever visits me and visits my father Ibrahim, yani the Prophet, السلام, and visits my father Ibrahim in one year, yani in the same year, then I will guarantee for him on behalf of Allah al jannah. That's it. You want to go to Jannah? Just go visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the grave of Ibrahim. Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala said that this hadith is batil. That it's futile. A lie. And that it was fabricated or concocted by, as in his own words, Ba'd al-Fajrah. Yani some, someone evil, some despicable person who concocted this hadith. And a number of hadith, a number of scholars of hadith have mentioned that this hadith is not authentic, rather that it is fabricated, it is a lie attributed to the Prophet wasallam. The fourth and final hadith that he mentions is 
حديث من زار قبري وجبت له شفاعتي whoever visits my grave then my intercession has become obligatory for him or my intercession is established for him in this hadith al-uqayli rahimahullah ta'ala who was a fourth century scholar scholar of hadith scholar of jarh al said after this hadith that all of the narrations that deal with this topic of visiting the grave of the prophet sallallahu wasallam are inauthentic they are all weak likewise ibn hajar rahimahullah ta'ala said that there is no authentic hadith on this topic that is the topic of visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though uh, as we mentioned before that the scholars have consensus that it is mustahab that it is something desirable to visit the grave of the Prophet Alaihi As-Salatu Wa Tammu Taslim Tayyib Ikhwan so that we understand that we understand the issue here again is about the issue of intention. No one is saying, no one is saying, and none of the scholars of the past that I have come across is saying that you should not visit the grave of the Prophet Wasallam. but what they are saying is that you don't travel for that purpose, that there is no travel that is to be done for that purpose. Now the author Rahimullah Ta'ala is going to talk about the desirability or the istihbab of visiting Masjid Quba and visiting the Baqir, which is the graveyard here, and also visiting the graves of the martyrs who died in the battle of Uhud. Naam. Chapter, it's recommended to visit Masjid Quba, Al-Baqir, and the graves of the martyrs. It's desirable for the visitor to visit Masjid Quba and pray in it due to an authentic narration on the authority of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to visit Masjid Quba walking and riding to pray two rakahs in it. On the authority of Sahal ibn Hanif, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man tatahara fi baytihi thumma ata masjid quba fasalla fihi salatan kana lahu ka ajri umrah. Whoever performs wudu at home and then goes to Masjid Quba to pray two rakahs will have the reward of the one performing umrah. Now, so here, the author Rahimullah Ta'ala, he begins by talking about the virtues of Masjid Quba. And it is known that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as it comes to Hadith Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to go to Masjid Quba Septen is how it comes in the narration. Uh, most of them interpret that to mean every Saturday, but it could also mean once a week. It could also mean once a week. So perhaps here there is a virtue of visiting the masjid on Saturday. But the point is that the Prophet ﷺ would visit Masjid Quba once a week. Sometimes he would go walking and sometimes he would go riding as it comes in this narration of Ibn Umar. And then there's the other hadith, the authentic hadith that is collected by Ibn Umajah and uh, and Nasa'i in his Sunan that Sahal ibn Hunayf rahimahullah ta'ala said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever uh, purifies himself in his home and he makes wudu in his home and then he goes to Masjid Quba and prays therein two rakahs then he will have the reward of Umrah then it is as if he has or he has the reward of Al Umrah and uh, many of you know the story of Masjid Quba and its significance in Islam because it was the first Masjid built in Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina and he came to Medina with Abu Bakr Siddiq Ta'ala and when they got to Medina, the people were anticipating the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously, those who were from amongst the Muhajireen, they knew who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was and they knew who Abu Bakr was. Ta'ala. But some of the Ansar, the helpers, the people of Medina, they didn't know and they thought that actually Abu Bakr, when they were coming, they thought that Abu Bakr is Siddiq Ta'ala, and who was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because his hair had begun to, to turn gray but when he saw the 
when he saw uh, when they saw Abu Bakr as Siddiq shielding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with uh, a cloth that he had with him or a sheath, then they knew that who the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. Anyway, when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam made it to Medina, uh, his first action before he built his house and before he made it here to the inside of Medina and built this masjid, his first order of business was to build Masjid Quba. And it is considered to be the masjid that is built upon taqwa. The masjid usisa ala taqwa, haqwa an taquma fi. So it is a masjid that has been established upon the obedience and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and righteousness and piety. But here, just as a side point, notice that the Prophet Sallallahu first order of business when he came to Medina was the establishment of the masjid. Likewise, Ikhwan, for you, when you are choosing where you're going to live, uh, especially when you are living in the lands of the non-Muslims, you should choose a place to live that is close to the masjid. A place where it is easy for you to get to the masjid and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the rest of the believers. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and bow down with those who bow down. Make ruku' with those who make ruku'. So it's important for a person to have that attachment to the masjid. Because if it wasn't important, the Prophet sallallahu would have started with something else. But it shows the extreme importance of the masjid and one being attached to the masjid. Not just because it is better to pray in the masjid, and for some people it is obligatory to pray in the masjid, and in general, salah and jama'ah, yani praying in congregation is obligatory, but also because it is a way for a Muslim to strengthen his deen in general. That there are other Muslims in the masjid that he will benefit from, or perhaps he may benefit them with something. And that there is a relationship established amongst the Muslims in any particular locality. So that they know one another. And who is it that's going to bury you? Who is it that is going to check on you? SubhanAllah, some of the people die, they're in their homes for two, three weeks. And the only way that it's known that they are dead is, waliyadu billah, that there is a stench that is coming from that place. And some of the neighbors trying to figure out what's going on. Why haven't you taken out the trash, for example? What is that smell coming from this place? So a believer has to have that kind of relationship with the other believers in his locality. Tayyip. So the Prophet Sallallahu here mentioned for us the virtues of Masjid Quba. And as was mentioned before, what is your opinion now? After hearing this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all right, we know that there is a specific virtue for praying in Masjid Quba. Right? That virtue is what? That whoever prays two rakahs there, then he gets the reward as if he has made an umrah. And we know for a surety that the Prophet Sallallahu used to go there every week. Correct? What if a person, what if a person now, travels from Mecca, for example, with the intention of visiting Masjid Quba? What do you think about that? No. Why not? Because the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited from traveling, except to visit those three masjids. Even though there's a specific hadith here that talks about the virtue. Tell you, do we have any specific hadith that talks about the virtue, authentic hadith, that talk about the virtue of visiting the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi No, we don't have any specific hadith that talk about that. So even more so, traveling to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu is not legislated. Though again, it is legislated to visit his grave once one arrives in Medina. Now, Father, go ahead. It is also a sunnah for the visitor to visit the graves in Baqiya, the graves of the martyrs and the grave of Hamza ta'ala anhu, because the Prophet Sallallahu used to visit them and pray for them. And due to the Prophet's statement Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zuru al-Qubura fa'innaha tudhakkirukum al-akhirah Muslim. Visit the graves for indeed they remind you of the hereafter. Notice that the author, how many masjids did he mention in Medina? If we start from the beginning, he mentioned the Prophet Sallallahu masjid and he mentioned Masjid Quba. Any other masjids the author mentioned? No. What about Qiblatayn? What about Ma'al Ghumama? Masjid Al Ghumama? Masjid Uthman? Masjid Bilal? Why didn't the author say anything about them? Why didn't he mention any hadith about them? Because there aren't any. 
because there aren't any ahadith that talk about the virtue of visiting any of these other masajid. And for that reason, for that reason, we see subhanAllah that sometimes we find, especially the older brothers and the, and the, and the women as well, hopping in taxis and going around mazarat, mazarat. And a lot of people are making money off of this. And they're going to all of these places and perhaps missing the virtue of praying in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid and definitely missing the virtue of sitting in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Masjid and they're going to all of these other places that are not, that, that, that nothing in the Sharia indicates that it is legislated to visit them or that there's any benefit in doing so. Or that there's any benefit in doing so. If a person, if a person travels, they have a tour guide and they want to see certain aspects of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu to know where things happen, then some of the scholars say that this is okay to do. But to go to visit, for example, Seba Masajid, Alhamdulillah, they, those are not there anymore. There's another masjid now that is one masjid, that is Masjid Al-Khandaq, but even this, it's not legislative for one to go visit it with the intention of getting some special reward for doing so, or for praying in Qiblatain, or any of these other masjids. The two masjids that are, that are legislated for you to visit in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are this masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid, and Masjid Quba, and that is it. And then the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, goes on to talk about visiting the graves. So first he mentions going to Al-Baqir. And Al-Baqir, for those of you who have not gone from the time that they have come to Medina, then bi Ta'ala, after Isha, you should go. If you haven't gone yet, then you should go after Isha. Follow the janazah, assuming that there's a janazah after Isha. Follow it and go to Al-Baqir, which is on the east side of the masjid, yani outside of the masjid, going that direction, over there. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to visit Al-Baqir. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, I actually mentioned that the Prophet would visit the Baqir frequently and make dua for its inhabitants. The author Rahimullah Ta'ala also mentions going to the graves of the Shuhada, that is at Uhud. And as you know, Uhud is to the north of the masjid. In fact, uh, you can actually look out the door that is behind us here and you can see Uhud. You can actually see Uhud from here. So if you just go straight, then one would wind up at Mount Uhud. And it is there where the battle of Uhud took place and where many of the companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were martyred. And he mentioned specifically the grave of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu because of his virtue. He also mentions because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to visit those graves and he would make dua for them and because of the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Zuru Al-Qubura Fa Inna Tudakirukum Al-Akhira Visit the graves because they remind you of the hereafter. And what happens a lot of times, Ikhwan, is that for people who are trying to follow the way of the Salaf and follow Ali Sunnah Wal Jama'ah and they see what happens at the graves by way of innovation and people calling upon the people that are in the graves and people making tawaf and people making sajda on the graves and all of these things. So what happens is as a, as a reaction to that, we find people that are trying to hold fast to the sunnah, they don't go to the graves at all. And this is another mistake. Because the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to visit the graves. And Ibn Abdul Bar, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and others from amongst the scholars of the past mentioned that there is, there is consensus amongst the scholars that it is mustahab to visit the graves. And many of them include women in that, as we discussed earlier. So here, the issue of visiting the graves is something important because it reminds you of the hereafter. And this is something that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi encouraged in many a hadith. You will find that the hadith starts out, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. You probably from hearing it so much, even if you don't know Arabic, you know that. Whoever believes in Allah and what? 
and the last day. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. فَلْيَكُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ For example, then let him say that which is good or let him be quiet. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهُ Then let him be generous to his guest. And many a hadith like this with the Prophet وسلم, is combining between the belief in Allah and the belief in the last day. Because if you believe in Allah, you believe that He is your creator, you believe that He's the only one that deserves to be worshipped, and you also believe that you are going to stand in front of Him again and be held accountable for the worship that you have done or not done, then that helps the servant to be upright. One of the Salaf had a relative who was not upright. He was lax in his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had a careless attitude towards ibadah. And so he took him to the grave. He took him to the graveyard. And he said, look at them. And he left them for a minute to look and think. He said, what do you think that one of them wishes for? What do you think that one of them wishes for? In fact, if you were in their place, what would you hope for? He said, I would hope, this is the one who was lax in his ibadah. He said, I would hope that Allah would put me back on earth and give me another chance to worship him properly. Like some of them will say, oh, oh, oh our Lord, send us back, send us back. Perhaps I will do something, I will do some righteous deeds. So he said to him, he said, he said to, he said to him, I would hope that I could go back to life and perform righteous deeds. He said, here you are. Here you are standing with that chance. Yani you don't have to wish after you die. Allah has now allowed you to understand this concept now. That after you die, you wish you could come back and do righteous deeds. Go to the Baqir tonight after Salat al-Isha. And think about that. Think about the many generations of Muslims who have been buried there. The heroes of Islam. The companions of the Messenger وسلم, who died in Medina are all there. And with their righteousness and with everything that they put forth, it had to come to an end and it stopped and they were buried. And recognize that you still have that chance. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is something that, okay, if you do it tonight, inshallah ta'ala, it will last with you. It will have some type of effect. But then, as we know, iman increases and decreases. And there will come a time where perhaps you feel your iman decreasing. You've left Medina, you've gone back to whatever, and you're surrounded by things that don't remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or maybe even take you away from the remembrance of Allah. Tayyib, take that opportunity. Take that opportunity when you feel like that. And go back. Visit the graves of the Muslims. And remind yourself of the hereafter. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it comes to Sahih Muslim, visited the grave of his mother. And he cried to the point that it made everyone around him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, cry. And he said, I sought permission from Allah to make istighfar for my mother, to ask for her forgiveness. But he didn't give me permission. And I sought permission from Allah to visit, the, to visit her. And he gave me that permission. Tayyib. What do we understand from this? That the aspect of visiting the grave is so that one remembers the hereafter. Even though the Prophet ﷺ could not make dua for her, the other aspect of visiting the grave, which is what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this hadith, visit the graves because they remind you of the hereafter. They remind you of that meeting with Allah Jalla Jalalu. The Prophet ﷺ used to teach his companions when they visited the graves to say, Assalamu Alaikum. 
أهل ديار من المؤمنين والمسلمين وإنا إن شاء الله بكم لاحقون نسأل الله لنا ولكم العافية خرجه مسلم من حديث سليمان بن بريدة عن أبي Peace be upon you, O people of the dwellings, believers and Muslims. Insha'Allah, if Allah wills, we will join you. We ask Allah to grant us and you well-being. Also on the authority of Ibn Abbas anhuma, that the Prophet وسلم, passed by the graves of Medina and he faced them saying, Assalamu alaykum ya ahl al-qubur. Allahu lana wa lakum antum salafuna wa nahnu bil athar. Peace be upon you, O people of the graves. May Allah forgive us and you. You are, you have preceded us and we are on the path. It's clear from the four. No, no, no. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to teach his companions and from amongst them in this hadith he actually taught this dua to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. When they would visit the graves he would teach them to say now listen to this hadith because if you don't know this hadith then you should learn it. So many people go to the graves and they say all types of things. Maybe they gather up together and read Quran, read Fatiha, or read something else. And this is not something that was known from the Prophet or from any of the companions, that they would gather at the grave site or the graveyard and they would recite Quran, for example. This is not known. This is the dua that is known that the Prophet would teach his companions. And again, the Prophet was the one who was most sincere to this ummah and the one who gave the best advice to this ummah. So a person who wants to be from the followers of the Prophet and gain that reward should learn this dua right now. He used to say, or he used to teach them, Assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyari min al-mu'mineen wa al-muslimin. Assalamu alaykum ahl al-diyari min al-mu'mineen wa al-muslimin. That's not too difficult. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, you already know what that means. Ahl al diyar yani, O oh people, O oh inhabitants of this place. O oh inhabitants of this place, Ahl al diyar Min al mu'minin wal muslimin. From amongst the believers and from amongst the Muslims. Which is one of the proofs that Ahl al-Sunnah used to show that there is a difference between Islam or Iman and Islam, and that Iman is at a higher level. Alright? So, to the believers and the Muslims. وَإِنَّا إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَاحِكُونَ And we, by the permission of Allah, will be joining you. We, by the permission of Allah, will be joining you. Yeah, and we're going to die as well. وَإِنَّا إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَاحِكُونَ نَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ لَنَا وَلَكُمُ الْعَافِيَةِ We ask Allah for us and for you الْعَافِيَةِ يعني well-being well-being طيب There's, so that if you break it down into three السلام عليكم أهل الديار من المؤمنين والمسلمين وَإِنَّا إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ لَاحِكُونَ نَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ لَنَا وَلَكُمُ الْعَافِيَةِ Alright, and if you can't memorize it in Arabic right now, at least memorize the meaning in English and say it. When you go, at least say assalamu alaikum. We ask Allah for us and for you well-being or whatever you can remember from this dua. But the point is try to memorize this dua and visit the graves. And visit the graves because they will remind you of the hereafter. But as we're going to the graves and making up things to do, we get together and uh, you know, two people, one person is going going to read one page of Quran and this one is going to read another page and we read it at the grave we gather there this is not something that is known from the companions of the messenger so light it was someone from the messenger himself now <coughs> It's clear from the aforementioned ahadith that the purpose behind visiting the graves legislatively, legislatively is to be reminded of the hereafter, to do good to the dead by making dua for them and asking Allah to have mercy upon them. So these are the reasons why a person visits the graves. Number one, to remind himself of the hereafter, to send the salams to the inhabitants of the grave and to make dua for them. To make dua for them, not to them. To make dua for them. No. As for visiting, as for visiting them to make dua at their graves and to remain there.
there for a long period of time to ask them to fulfill one's needs or to cure the sick or to ask Allah through them or by their status, etc. This visitation is bid'ah and rejected and Allah and His Messenger have not legislated, legislated it. Nor have the Salaf done this. Rather, it is from the Hujr that the Prophet وسلم, prohibited us from when he said, Zuru al Qubur, Hujra. Visit the graves and do not say anything that is Hujr, that is inappropriate. The common denominator between the aforementioned things is that they are all bid'ah. However, they differ in degrees. Some of these things are bid'ah and not shirk, like asking Allah at the graves and asking by the right of the deceased and his status, etc. However, some of these things are shirk al akbar like supplicating to the dead and seeking help and seeking help from from them, etc. As mentioned. So, so here the author Rahimullah Ta'ala goes on to say that for one who goes to the grave to make dua at the grave or to remain there for a long time, yani what he calls al ukuf making etikaf basically at the grave, to make dua there. Or to ask those inhabitants of the grave, those who have already died, to ask them to fulfill some type of need or to cure one that is sick. Then this is all considered to be a rejected heresy. This this type of visit is not from the Sunnah. This type of bid'ah, this type of visit is bid'ah that Allah subhanahu wa taala has not legislated, nor have any of the righteous predecessors done. And it is from the inappropriate speech that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned in the hadith that was collected by an Imam Ahmad and Imam Malik in his muwatta, zuru al kubur Visit the graves, but do not say anything inappropriate when you are at the graves. Don't when you go to the graves, okay? The most inappropriate thing that someone can say is something that contains the du'a of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's shirk. Yeah, and calling upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But likewise, some people go to the graves and they say, Oh Allah, why did you choose him and not Fulan, for example? Questioning Allah subhanahu decree, which will indicate some type of disbelief in decree. And all of this is from Al Hujr. Yeah, that which is inappropriate, that which is evil to be said. So the Prophet said, Visit the graves, but beware of saying anything that is evil. And all of these things that the author mentioned, Rahimullah Ta'ala, uh, the common denominator between them is that they are all innovations that should not be done. They are all heretical practices. Some of them re re uh, uh, reach the level of shirk, and that is when one is calling upon other than Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, and who is more astray than the one who calls upon other than Allah, who will not answer him until Yom al Qiyamah, and he's not even aware that he is being supplicated. So this calling upon other than Allah is shirk. However, for one who makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the grave, then this is bid'ah. This is not something that was done by the Prophet or his companions, but it has not reached the level of shirk. Nah. Therefore, be cautious and ask your Lord for tawfiq and hidayah to the truth, for he the exalted is the one who grants success and guides. There is no deity worthy of worship except him, and there is no Lord except him. Nah. هذا آخر ما أردنا ما عندك هذا طيب then Rahimullah Ta'ala says at the end, and this is the last of what we wanted to mention. Walhamdulillahi awwalan wa akhira. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning and in the end, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise the status of our Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his slave and his messenger and his chosen one from amongst his creation. Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa man tabi bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. Walhamdulillahi ladi bi ni'matihi tatimu salihat.
again, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is by His grace that we were able to finish uh, the book at tahqiq wal Idah, verification and explanation of the many or numerous affairs related to Hajj and Umrah and Ziyarah. And it is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace that all righteous actions are complete. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on the author of the book, an Imam Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, and to continue to allow us and the ummah to benefit from his knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and for and all of you our shortcomings. Now. Jazakum Allahu Khairan wa Barakallahu Fikum wa Nafa Allahu Bima Kultum. Should we read Yaseen at the graveyard? What about reading the Quran for a dead relative? This is a two-part question. The first is about reading Surat Yasin at the graveyard. There's a hadith that is narrated, or a few actually, where the Prophet is reported to have said, Iqra'u, Iqra'u Surat Yasin ala mutakum. To read Surah Yasin to your motakum. I'm going to leave it like that for a reason. Because there's another hadith where the Prophet wasallam said, Lakinu motakum. La ilaha illallah. Repeat, La ilaha illallah to your mota. So does this mean those who have already died or those who are considered to be on their deathbed? Obviously, you don't need to repeat la ilaha illallah to someone who has already died. So the first hadith, which is to read Surah Yasin to your mota. The meaning of that hadith, the correct interpretation of that hadith is read it to the ones who are on their deathbeds. That is, for those who say that the hadith is authentic. And the correct opinion is that hadith is not authentic. It's not authentically established that the Prophet Sallallahu said that. Nor is it established that any of the companions used to do that. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows best. But even if, even if the hadith is sahih, it does not mean that one goes to the grave or the graveyard and they read Surah Yasin while they are at the graveyard. This is incorrect. As for the second part of the question, which is uh, dealing with reading the Quran for a dead relative. This is one of those issues where the scholars of old have differed. And the scholars of the present day, obviously they are followers of the scholars of the past. The author of the book that we just finished studying, Dr. Aziz ibn Abbas, ta'ala, he says that it is better to leave off reading Quran on behalf of someone who is dead. He said because there is no evidence that supports it, or there is no specific evidence that supports it. And Shaykh Uthameen, Allah yarhamu, takes the opposite opinion, and that is that reading Quran on behalf of those who have died is permissible and that the reward reaches them. And this is something, again, like Sheikh Ben Baz rahimahullah ta'ala said, this is not one of those issues where the one who differs with us is considered to be a mubtadi' or that they have said something that is haram or bid'ah or something like this. Not because both opinions have evidence. The Hanbalis and the Hanafis both say, and there are some Shafi'is as well, that take the opinion that anything that one does, he can gift that the reward of that action to one who has died. And there is no doubt amongst the Ummah, as Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in the Muqaddim of Sahih Muslim, that the Ummah has agreed that there is consensus amongst the Ummah that if you give sadaqah on behalf of one who has died, then the reward reaches them. If you give sadaqah on behalf of one who has died, that the reward reaches them. Likewise, there is no difference of opinion about dua. So one who makes dua, 
And this is actually the most that you'll find that the Salaf used to do for one another is that they would make dua for one another and that the reward of that dua reaches the individual. Likewise, there are authentic hadith that indicate that you can fast on behalf of one who has passed. That is for those who have a fast to make up or for those who have vowed to fast and did not fulfill that vow that one can fast on their behalf. There are a hadith that indicate that. Likewise, Hajj and Umrah. That, that it can be performed on one on behalf of one who has died. So those other scholars came and said that all of the other acts of ibadah, like reading the Quran, like making dhikr, that these that they fall under this general category of ibadah that we see here. We see, for example, sadaqah, fasting, uh, um, making hajj and umrah. That all of this has been authentically reported in a hadith that a per that the reward reaches the one who has died. So therefore, likewise, other ibadat. Those who say no, and they are the majority of the Shafi'is and the Malikis. Those who say no. That, is, that, you, that you cannot gift the reward of any of your actions to those who have passed. They say that it is restricted to that which specifically the Dalil mentions. And those are those forms of ibad. And they likewise use different uh, ayat from the Quran, like the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa lil insani illa ma sa'a. And there is nothing uh, for a, a, an individual except for that which he put forth, yani for his own sa'i. But the interpretation of that ayah, or that ayah, is subject to a different interpretation which we don't have the time to go into right now. The point is that this is a, an, an area where the scholars of the past have differed. That is reading the Quran and gifting the reward of that to those who have passed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now. What is the best amal a person can do at the Prophet's grave? The best thing that a person can do at the Prophet Sallallahu grave is to give him the salams and to remember the hereafter because that fikr, yani making oneself remember the hereafter is something that is an ibadah in and of itself. And Allah Azza wa Jal praises those who remember him and who think about the creation of the heavens and the earth in the Quran. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض. Those who remember Allah while they are standing, while they are sitting, while they are on their sides, and they think about ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض. They think about the creation of the heavens and the earth because this is something that increases them in their iman. So one. When they visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu is to remember the hereafter because this was the best man to walk the face of the earth and he was the one who was most beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and if he can die or he did die then every one of us is going to die without a doubt. So remember death, give salams to the Prophet Sallallahu by saying Assalamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah and if you want to add Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh then there is no harm in doing so and likewise as the scholars have mentioned, if you want to send a salat upon the Prophet وسلم, while you are there by saying Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidu majid and that is fine to do as well. Then one steps to the right and they say assalamu alayka ya Abu Bakr and then they step to the right and say assalamu alayka ya Umar. I sent money to another country for Udhiyah. The people in that country performed Salat al Aid before us, before us as they are 11 hours ahead. So if the animal was sacrificed before I prayed Aid, is my Udhiyah accepted? Yes, the Udhi is accepted because it is counted amongst the people whom it was sent to. So the, as long as the Udhi was performed after the one who is slaughtering the animal, actually the one who is actually performing the slaughter. So for example, these people are praying at 7 o'clock in the morning, but we are 11 hours ahead of them, for example. As long as they, that person that is going to slaughter the animal, has performed Salat al-Eid, then the Udhi accounts. I was pushing my mother in a wheelchair while making tawaf. Is my tawaf valid? 
as long as the person who was pushing his mother also had the intention for himself that he is making tawaf, then the tawaf is valid for both him and for the mother. And that goes for Sa'i as well. You said Sa'i or tawaf? Tawaf. Hey, it goes, it's the same for Sa'i and for tawaf. Likewise, the same ruling applies to one who has a child with him and needs to carry the child. If the child is of the age where they have the ability to, what, they, what is known as the age of tamiz, that is they have reached the age of seven and they uh, the age of discernment and they have the ability to make their own niya and they made a niya for themselves but you need to carry them as certain portions of the of the tawaf or of the sa'i then it it counts for both